populations in Greenland, but we see a few almost every year now since 2010. So are these like migrants? And then we have greater white fronted goose, which is a bird that's found breeding in the western part of North America. And they are so common now, so common that they're not even reviewed anymore by the main bird records committee as a rare bird. So we call these greater birds, they are not here, not many, they're here. Uh, and then we have herons, a bird like the little egret, which was, I think, first in 2011, was the first one that was found in the but they show up every year now. So you can see a few. You can pick up a little egret on your, on your life list or on your year list every year if you want to. And then we have this whole group of birds that are called eruptive species. Eruptive species. So erupt is just the opposite of erupt. Are you, are you getting to some back? Uh, I, I'm hearing some back uh, reverb in my screen here. Is on my new. Oh, okay. And I'll just come to the front of it. Um, she she means she is not, right? Invalt means she is when you move into. She can feel option is on moving of birds into a particular area. And we have a number of these different you know, species. Which is this cool bird here, the northern hawkowl. And I say, I see the challenge here. It refers to the hawkowl, I see. Okay, just a few lines in our house. It's not even on room 27, but we'll be putting on the newsroom. These are the ones that bring in time today. And what happens with them is sometimes their hoops fly, and the opponents, many things. And so when that happens, they are forced to move south. So every now and then we get a little monk out, maybe once every five or ten years. Same thing with the little brain or the They come down um, every single little thing. Sometimes you move tumors, like 50 or 60. But then we get so many hours. So they occur here every year almost. See, so you follow these birds or any numbers or not. Yep. Can you hear me now? Still. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay. No, it's
can say something. Hello, how are you folks? Okay, his microphone is working. Yeah, so somehow the signal's not getting out. Could you hear that, Pat? Oh, she can, okay. Hi. All right. Yes, hi, Herb, yes. <laughs> Okay. It, okay. It's faint and and fuzzy, but I but the but I've got it back. The audio's back. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll probably be closer to the microphone when I start speaking. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So now we just got to get the now we gotta get the slides back. Looks like oh, has that been X'd out? I'm not sure. Okay. There we go. Okay. okay, we're all everybody in everybody in Zoom land happy now. Mm. Yeah, sort of. Okay, all right. Here we go. Okay, so we we were, we were talking about these eruptive species that breed well to our north that irregularly are forced down into Maine, and we get to enjoy their presence. Are these vagrants or not? Well, they're fairly regular, and that's certainly the case with lots of these northern finches that we have, like common red pole that come down every other year or so when the birch seeds don't do so well in the high Arctic where they breed. So they're forced to come to see us. Um, so are these uh, vagrants or not? Well, what I'm gonna do is to uh, restrict myself to birds that I think you will all agree are vagrants. So a vagrant for the purpose of this talk from now on out is a bird species that has been seen in Maine five times or fewer. Sometimes just a single time, five times or fewer. So these are the rarest of the rare. And those are the ones that we're going to, to deal with here. And what I did was to take a look at the Maine Bird Records Committee webpage. And I went through all of the different birds that they have listed there. And the things that are rare, they note the number of times they've been, been seen. And what I found is that uh, there are actually 49 species of birds that have only been seen in Maine a single time. Now that's a vagrant, okay? Then there are 26 more that have only been seen twice. I think 11 that have been seen three or four times and nine or so that have been seen five, seen five times. What I'm going to do is to stick to the first two categories, the ones that have been seen once and a couple or three that have been seen twice. And I'm gonna spend my, my time talking about them. They all have different stories to tell, and the stories that they tell are, are, have a chronological component. Because if you look at when vagrants, when these vagrants tend to occur, the best time to see them is in May. A lot of times these birds are coming north to breed and they may get lost. And then the second best month is right now, October. So, and if you're looking for vagrants, then you probably don't wanna go out in March, not the greatest time. So what we're going to do then is to look at different uh, vagrants. And what we're going to try to understand is why, how did they end up getting here? You know, Roger Tory Peterson had this uh, wonderful phrase that I love that he said, uh, he said, birds have wings and they use them. So, <laughs> so you, ne you never know, <laughs> you, can't, you can't really be surprised when a bird shows up. But what I've done here next is to prepare a, a slide that just talks about the different ways that a vagrant may be transported to Maine. And one is a weather-related transport. Now, we've got a hurricane that's about to hit, uh, hit uh, Florida, and the hurricanes that hit the Caribbean all the time. But it turns out that when bird, land birds on an island are uh, since a, a hurricane or a big storm, they seek cover, and they are very, very rarely transported by, by heavy winds. But birds that are oceanic, that spend most of their time at sea, they're gonna be picked up by those winds and moved to the north. So just a few years ago, after a hurricane, it didn't hit us, thankfully, but produced lots of winds that were north, north, northbound. Uh, we ended up with lots of black skimmers along the main coast, just for a few days. And they were clearly transported by weather, the northernmost uh, population of these, I think, is in New Jersey. So they were, they were pushed far north. So weather can make a difference. When a, when a land bird is migrating, it can in, it end up in a, in a front where the winds suddenly change direction. And so they can be pushed uh, offshore and sometimes northward when they're trying to go southward. So it's not surprising that a lot of these vagrants show up on places that offer refuge 
namely islands. So Monhegan Island has Matinicus Rock. Those have lots and lots of vagrants because it's the first place that these birds that are thrown off course uh, can find some refuge. So that's one type of explanation. Then navigational errors. So we know that birds use a number of different uh, cues to migrate. They can use the position of the sun, position of the moon, the position of polarized light, which indicates where the sun is set, the ma Earth's magnetic field. They can recognize landmarks. Not all birds do all of these, but those are some of the ones that have been used by, by birds. But we can, take, we can make a gross generalization and talk about um, learned versus imprinted migration routes. So a lot of birds that aren't songbirds um, have family units and the young are taught the migration route by the adults. They all migrate as a family, isn't that sweet? Down to wherever they're going to, to overwinter. And then they learn the way and they can go back north in the, in the spring. But a lot, virtually all land birds have their migration route genetically imprinted. They have no, where, no idea where they're gonna go. They just know where they should go, which direction they should fly. So it's most remarkable. Well, anytime you have genes involved, what's possible? Mutations. So occasionally you get a bird that has a mutation. So when it is told to migrate to the Northeast, it migrates to the Southwest. And so it goes 180 degrees off course. And there's some genetic mutations that cause the birds to migrate in other directions than 180 degrees. But the classic example of this phenomenon, reverse migration, is that a bird goes 180 degrees opposite where it should go. And I have a nice example to talk to, talk to you about that toward the end of the talk. Okay. Then we have something that's called post-breeding dispersal. So it's particularly common in herons and egrets and ibises. And here's an example. A glossy ibis, after they finish breeding, will often move northward, particularly the younger ones. Are they prospecting for places to breed next year or are they, is it just wanderlust? Uh, and I can tell you a little bit about what happened in, uh, well, in, from my own experience in North Carolina, when I was a graduate student along the, the coast of North Carolina in 19, early 1970s, mid 1970s, Glossy Ibis had their Northern breeding range right in Moorhead City where our Institute was. So we were all very proud of the fact that we had the northernmost limit. But what happens every year is that some of those glossy ibis would go a little bit further north, and then they would all fly south to overwinter in Florida or other places that were less prone to freezing. Um, but over the course of time, what they did is to start moving northward. And now we have glossy ibis nesting in Scarborough Marsh, even, even in down East Maine. So they, this post-breeding dispersal has actually resulted in a range extension for these species. And it's also true for other er herons and egrets as well. Then we have birds that overshoot their breeding area. So this particular explanation involves migratory breeding birds. So they're birds that are, are flying as hard as they can, particularly males, to get north so they can get at the best uh, breeding ground. And sometimes they go a little bit too far, not often hugely far, but a little bit too far. And here are a couple of examples, three examples. Um, one is a hooded warbler. Um, they breed in, in Connecticut. A worm-eating warblers breed in Connecticut, and summer tanagers are even into Massachusetts. They don't breed here, so we consider them vagrants, but they're vagrants only for a short time because they went, oh, a little bit too far. I got to backtrack to get down to where I want to be breeding. So that's another reason for, for vagrants, overshooting the breeding area. And then um, sort of related to the post-breeding dispersal is range expansion. But range expansion can happen at any time of the year, and if a bird population is huge, they may move northward to try to establish new breeding areas. And you all know, you can all give many examples of this sort of thing in Maine, but I'll give you just a, a few. The blue wing warbler, uh, just a few were found in the Falmouth area, but now they are a regular breeding bird in the southern part of the state. So they've expanded. Red-bellied woodpeckers, unheard of 30 years ago, and now they are really, really common uh, in the state. They're, they're all the way up into the uh, northern part of Arista County. Turkey vultures the same way. They now, they used to be very rare. <laughs> if anyone saw a turkey vulture, you would, just, you would just go out and celebrate because you had a rarity. 
for Maine. And nowadays it's, oh no, another turkey vulture. So the last one is one that we can uh, I'll list because people often trot this one out, a ship assisted transport and other human aided transport. But this actually turns out to be very uncommon that particularly for a bird that's migratory, if it lands on a ship, it's not gonna stay there for very long. So the only examples we have of ship assisted transport are birds that aren't migratory. And one classic example is this Indian bird, it's called the Indian purple crow, and it was transferred in a ship to different islands and it got off the boat and established itself, but it was not migratory. So we wouldn't really consider that a vagrant, right? It didn't get there on, it, on its own. Okay. So when we think about vagrants, uh, it's often interesting to think about, can I tell where you came from based on your morphology? That there are often uh, different subspecies or different forms in different parts of the range of a bird. And there are a few of those that have happened here in, in Maine, and they're sort of fun. Um, one of which is this junco. And if you take a look at the junco, you'll notice that its back is brown. So this is one of the uh, different forms of the, of the dark-eyed junco. You can see the different morphs on the map on the right that uh, are distinctive. And the Oregon junco, Oregon dark-eyed junco, is found here. But occasionally, they show up uh, in, in, um, in Maine. So we, we get one every now and again, uh, like this one that showed up at Reed State Park one December. And then European wimbrels, you all know the wimbrel is a short bird with a long decurved bill. This photograph is not great, but it's in fact taken in Maine. Uh, and you can, perhaps if you squint a little bit, you can tell that, problems again? They can't see the slides. Oh, no. This is what the turkey doodle is. Okay. Slides now? Zoom, you zoom, folks? Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Okay, we'll back up really fast and look at the others. No, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just go on from here. But this, this photograph was taken in Maine. And by the way, many of the, most of the photographs I'm showing you are ones that are taken, were taken in Maine of birds that are actual Maine migrants. Some of the pictures aren't very good, but it show, shows evidence that the bird occurred here in Maine. But anyway, this European wimbrel differs from ours because it has a white rump and a white tail. And that was the case with this particular bird, which is found in Hancock County on uh, 1 May. So that's sort of fun and a different kind of migrant. And then the great white heron. If any of you have been to the Florida Keys, you've seen the great white heron. It's a variant of the great blue heron, but it's perfectly white. Uh, and occasionally they get they disperse northward. And we had a great white heron in Maine, in Ox over in Oxford County in Stoneham, uh, one June. So how it got there, well, that's a good question. And then we have one more, this Dunlin, the, the bird in the background with the black belly, uh, is a type of shorebird. And the population in Greenland uh, is different from the population that we have on our Arctic tundra in that the bill is relatively short. So we knew this bird came from Greenland. So it's, not, it's a vagrant, but it's not a vagrant species. It's a vagrant morph or vagrant subspecies. Okay, so now we're into the teeth of the talk. And what I'm going to do is to go through, and we're just going to look at some of the rarities of, of that have occurred in Maine. And I suspect you'll salivate. Boy, I wish I could have seen that one. Boy, that was a really cool bird. But uh, we'll go through. And, and what we want to think about is, as you go through, can you think of a reason how this bird might have gotten to where it could was? Could it have been weather assisted? Could it have been post-breeding dispersal? Could it have been navigational error? Uh, in many cases, we just don't know. So the, we relish the fact that these birds occur here, occurred here, but how they got here, we don't always know. So anyway, we'll start with this bird here, the trumpeter swan, which is was once on the endangered species. And you can see that uh, they're found mostly in the far west of the North America. But interestingly, what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has done is to try to establish a population in Michigan and Wisconsin. So you can see those populations there. 
and it may well, in fact, be the, the trumpeter swan that we saw uh, in on Fortune's Rock down in York County uh, one April uh, was probably from one of those rather than from one in, in Washington State or, or the British Columbia, but a very cool migrant. And that's the only one that's ever been seen here. So that's one of the ones. A gargany, a very cool European duck. It's in the, the group of the, with the teal. And we've had two records in Maine, uh, both in the spring. One was in Belgrade uh, back in 1994. And another was in West Keg Marsh in 1999 in the spring. And Bess and I got to see that one. And that was a fun, fun bird to see. But how it got here from Europe, we don't know. Willow ptarmigan, He's, this is a grouse. You don't think about them migrating large dis distances, but one showed up and you can see that they're found at high latitudes in North America as well as Eurasia. But we had one show up on Greater Shabig Island one June and it stayed there for four weeks. So who knew? And it wasn't always easy to find. Betsy and I made two trips to try to find it and we struck out both times, but uh, some people were lucky enough to see them. And then this is one we did have luck with. Um, Clark's grebe is a large grebe that breeds in um, Western North America. And uh, one showed up on Togas Pond one August, two, two or three Augusts ago. So how it got here, we don't really know, but it was sure, it was sure fun to see it, Clark's grebe. And then bantail pigeon, take a look at the range map of that, far Western. We've had two records in Maine. One was on, on Monhegan Island and the other was in Southport Island. Um, up around Belfast area, I do believe. A tiny little little imp, the Calliope hummingbird, the smallest hummingbird in North America. And yet we have had one, that, two of them actually, that showed up, one in Monhegan in what month? October, good month for our vagrants, and another on the 1st of November at Blue Hill. But it's just am amazing to imagine these tiny little birds in late fall, or a in the middle of fall when there's not a whole lot of nectar around, somehow making it across the country. But you can see that the closest population was what Utah, maybe uh, uh, into Colorado. And then another hummingbird, with, uh, it's more associated with high mountains, um, the broad-tailed hummingbird all throughout the Rockies. And we've had one of them showed up here. When did it show up? Two days before Christmas, 2023. So thank goodness someone put out a bird feeder for it and was able to uh, to uh, hang on for a while. So that was in Freeport. Now, there is a group of birds that we call the rails. Um, and rails are furtive birds that live in marshes, uh, very rarely seen, and they have fairly short wings. But we've had a couple of interesting rails that showed up in, in the state, um, one of which will come later. But for now, we'll talk about the clapper rail which is a denizen of salt marshes in the southeastern United States, but occasionally one pops up a little bit to the north. And we had one in Scarborough Marsh, uh, one October, 2015. So, and the cool thing about the rails is that they, even though they have short wings, they're very good dispersers. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting that lots of island, oceanic islands have rails on them and, and they've since speciated and become endemics. So they, they somehow, despite the, the short wings, they think they could and they do uh, get long, go long distances. And then who's surprised that shorebirds, which often migrate from Arctic tundra all the way down to Southern uh, South America uh, may show up as vagrants. But one that showed up as a cool vagrant here was this European golden plover, which is not found in North America at all, as you can see, but rather uh, the closest population is on the west side of Greenland, and they're also, also in Iceland there. But we had one that showed up in Scarborough Marsh in October. Snowy plover looks a whole lot like one, one of our piping plovers, but the, the legs are light colored instead of dark. And um, you can see their populations are, are Midwest and further west. Um, and we had one showed up at Reed State Park one June for just a day or two. And then the bar-tail godwit is perhaps the most amazing of all shorebird migrants. They migrate from, um, from the high Arctic tundra in North America all the way to, get this one, Australia. So that's quite a, quite a distance to go. 
So it's perhaps not surprising, despite the fact that their breeding distribution isn't really close to us, that one showed up here in Maine. It was on uh, Petit Manan National Wildlife Refuge, just off the shore, offshore in Washington County. And then we have the puffin relatives. So the ancient murrelet, that's the one in the front here. And this again is the, the one that occurred here. So it's not the greatest picture, but it's good enough to identify it. Ancient murrelets are these puffin relatives. And you can see where they're found on the Pacific West, well, on the Pacific Rim, really, right? Um, so how did one get over here? Well, we don't know. But anyway, one showed up and it was a pretty cool sighting. Not that I got to see it, but then there are gulls. The sladyback gull is again a bird that's found along the uh, eastern, the western Pacific, so from uh, Russia on down into Japan. And occasionally we get vagrants that show up in, in Alaska, but sometimes they get even further. And we've had, actually had two of them. The one right smack in the middle is the sladyback gull that showed up at the um, at the recycling center, actually I shouldn't call it recycling center, at the dump in Augusta, it's an open fill area. Um, and one showed up just a few more, few years later there as well. Both of them were, uh, were winter records. So pretty cool, that's a, lot, that's a long way to go. That's a real long distance vagrant there. Then we have sooty terns, which are tropical terns. Um, and again, not really surprised that terns get moved around a lot, that they can fly, and they're often over the ocean. So you can imagine how a storm might push a sooty tern up into the Gulf of Maine. But we certainly had one of these guys, uh, and which showed up uh, out at Matinicus Rock, well offshore. And then there's this beautiful bird here, the white-winged tern. But it's, it's not so much a wanderer as a sooty tern. It doesn't spend as much time at sea but rather is more of an inland tern, like our black tern. And you can see their distribution is in Africa and in um, Eurasia. Uh, and somehow we ended up with a white-winged tern here. This showed up at Laudholm Beach down in Wells, uh, 1 June 2003. This is a great story. Uh, this, this is a red-billed tropic bird, which is a, uh, a pelagic bird. It spends most of its life at sea. And you can see their breeding distribution is pretty strictly tropical. But one has showed up uh, in, uh, off of Seal Island and Matinicus Rock off the mid Main coast. One started showing up in 2003. And it's come back for 14 years. So uh, that's, it's one bird, so I consider it a vagrant. It just it doesn't get the memo that probably you're not going to find a mate here. But it keeps coming back. and so. Uh, actually, one of my friends has actually made a pretty good living because he has a boat and he takes people out to see to see the red bill tropic bird. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Then we have uh, the largest loon in the world is the yellow billed loon, uh, and it's shown here. It looks like a little like our common loon ex with the yellow bill. The difference is a larger size, and also the bill is held upward just like an like a Arctic, Arctic loon would do. Um, and this is a, a most amazing story that uh, a, a fellow in October uh, went on a, a fishing trip with, uh, off the coast of Cape Elizabeth uh, because he was, he's a birder. And he thought, well, while they're out there fishing, I'm going to look for birds. And what, when he, uh, on the 26th of October, he found this yellow bill loon out nine miles offshore. And got excited. Everyone got excited about it. And some people put together money to hire a boat captain to take them back out to about the same place. And guess what? They found it. So three days, three days later, they they had found it within two miles of where it was originally sighted. And that was the only only time it's ever been seen in Maine. But uh, a, a really cool sighting. Then here's another one of these uh, pelagic birds, the white chin storm petrel. And it's hard to see the white chin. But this is the picture of the one that actually occurred in Maine. You can see it's mostly a southern hemisphere bird, but again, spending lots of time at sea. So it's not hard to imagine that this is a bird that's been moved forward by, moved northward by, by winds, perhaps a, some sort of storm. Um, and the same thing is true of this Barolo shearwater, which we have one record uh, from 2021 out in the Gulf of Maine. And again, uh, you can see where these birds have been found. All that blue is any, anywhere that's oceanic, they can be found. So it's not too surprising. They breed off the coast of Africa, but you know, uh, one of these shorebirds can wander a thousand miles in a single day. 
they're very good at using the wind to, to move them around. So not as surprising, perhaps, as some of these other vagrants that we've seen. Then we've got mask boobies. They're related to the northern gannet, and again, tropical in nature. But we had one showed up one August in, uh, at Mount Desert Rock, uh, Mount Desert Rock off the coast of NDI. And then this, this was an odd one. This was a little pebble beach in Lemoyne, very, very far away from the ocean, well, far away from the open ocean. Uh, and this bird was resting there. It's a red-footed booby. And you can see they're mostly equatorial, in, in, nudging down into the southern part of the, of the world. Uh, but we found, someone found one here on a single day in, uh, in July. And then this is a bird that was recently seen. You, it may have hit the newspapers here, uh, at least in the Waterville area, they were calling it the fossil bird. But this uh, cormorant relative, the Anhinga, which is mostly in North America and the southeastern U.S., one showed up uh, in, in Maine in Somerville, not even close to, to uh, the <laughs> coast at all, uh, and was there for uh, five days. So a lot of people went to go see this, this bird. And then this was a weird one, too. Uh, again, roseate spoonbill. It showed up in, uh, in um, Sebec, Maine, in a little farm pond. First record for, North, for, uh, the, for New England, the bird that's found in the southern United States uh, along coastal areas, and somehow it ended up here. The zone-tailed hawk is found in the desert southwest. That's the closest populations here. Uh, when birders see one of these birds, they say, oh, there's a ZT. And then that, of course, has become translated into a pasta hawk. Get it? ZT? Pasta. <laughs> so anyway, the pasta hawk, we have one record uh, that for the state of Maine. Um, and barn owls are very common worldwide, but not in Maine. And we have two records, one in Belfast and one in Albion, uh, but very cool. That's the one in Albion there. Burrowing owls, western part of the United States. We've had two showed up in Maine, very cool birds. And then this is a type of falcon called a crested caracara that actually spends a lot of time on the ground chasing rodents. And we have had two show up in Maine. Um, and you can see that the closest population is, there's actually there's a population in Florida. I'm not sure if it shows up well on that map for you. Uh, it doesn't for me, but uh, there's also a population in Texas. But We've had two of them show up here, uh, one of them in the Waterville area, Unity area, and the other one down in uh, Bristol along the coast. And now we're off into the uh, passerines, the land birds. So here we have some Western birds we're gonna look at. Hammond's flycatcher here, single record. Where did it show up? Monhegan. Lots of great records from Monhegan. Gray flycatcher, also Western. Where did it show up? Monhegan. When? when? October, um, and there's a western flycatcher, which is a little early. It showed up in August, and this was out on Mount Desert Rock. So then this looks a whole lot like what you what you would call the blue-headed vireo here in Maine. The solitary vireo, the, the name it used to be, was actually split up into three different species. So we have the blue-headed, and there's cassins and plumbius. And guess what we found in Maine? Cassin's vireo as well, you see it's mostly western, and Plumbius, which is mostly Rocky Mountain. Uh, but we've had both of them show up on Matinicus Rock, well offshore. So it's a very common uh, swallow out west related to the tree swallows, and uh, we've had one show up, one April, in Bar Harbor, a very neat vagrant. That was one of these so-called one-day wonders, so people that got to see them can lord it over other birders that didn't get a chance to see it. So. Uh, that's a bragging rights for that one. Uh, this was a great little story. Rock wrens are found, uh, as you can see, in the Western North America. And one showed up at Perkins Cove in a gun quit uh, right, right before Thanksgiving in 2020. And it stayed there for three months. So anyone that wanted to see a rock wren in Maine or just a rock wren for the first time uh, could, could do that with this little hardy fellow here. We don't know whether it succumbed or if it decided to finally move, but. Uh, just imagining it surviving in late January in Maine is pretty amazing for these birds that aren't that hardy. And then thrashers, we all have brown thrashers in our yards, but this sage thrasher is found in Western North America and it showed up. We, we've had uh, two records, one down in Cape Netic, 
uh, on, actually Cape Natick two, two different times in two different years. So perhaps the same bird, who knows? Robin relatives, this is called a field fair. So we have to go to Europe to see them. But, or you could on the 23rd of April, go to Newcastle and there they had a field fair as well. How it got across the Atlantic, we just don't know. Navigational error perhaps, but that's an awful long flight over the ocean to get here. And the same thing is true of this bird, which is not a red-winged blackbird, but rather a bird just called a red wing, which is again a robin relative. And we had one that showed up at Capisic Pond in Portland uh, in 2021, and it stayed around for almost a month. So that was pretty cool. And then here's a European finch called the chaffinch. And that's on the, the uh, Euro European side. It had to get across here somehow. And one did, not this one here. I don't, don't have a picture of that, but it's a very, very pretty bird. And then here's, a, if you go to the high Rocky Mountains, you can see gray crowned rosy finch. In 1937, one was found in Gorham. Very odd, none seen since then here in the state. And this is a siskin. We have our pine siskins here, but the Eurasian siskin is a little more yellow uh, and occurs obviously in Europe and Asia. And we had one that showed up in Richmond, Maine. Actually, Peter Vickery had it at his at his bird feeder. Peter Vickery was the was the the king of uh, of birding in in Maine until his uh, unfortunate death a few years ago. Then we have some sparrows, chestnut colored sp log spur, a bird of grasslands in Wyoming and uh, Colorado, places like that. One showed up at all places, Bitterford, so not 2022 in June. And then another relative, Smith's, Smith's Longspur, showed up not far from here. That showed up in September again in Norwich Walk. And Betts and I got to see that one. That was a fun one to, to find. And then there are sparrows, like this Cassin Sparrow, Southwestern. One showed up at Mount Desert Rock. Uh, Black-throated Sparrow. This was a really cool one. You can see it came from quite a distance. But it ended up in Winter Harbor, and it stayed from the 1st of January until the 17th of March. So it stayed around a long time. And then Brewer sparrows, again, a southwestern species. And one showed up on Monhegan, uh, one May. And then one September, one showed up in Steuben, up in Washington County. And then Golden Crown Sparrow, beautiful. It's related to our White Crown, white crown Sparrow. Uh, and you can see that it's found along the Pacific coast, uh, but we ended up with uh, two here, one in Jefferson and one in Abbott up near Moosehead Lake. And then the green-tailed towhee, a very pretty little bird. Um, one record, Southwest Harbor. So how did it get here from so far west? We don't know for sure. Spotted towhee, this was another good one. It, showed, it was first found in the 19th of November by 2023 by Derek Lovich. And it was seen as late as 13 March of this year. And this was down in York County at Fort Fisher. And we have the Western Meadowlark here. Uh, and this is another one that was found in, in uh, Norwich Lock. So it looks very much like a Eastern Meadowlark, but the song is very, very different. So it was easy to identify it by that. Then we have cowbirds like the shiny cowbird, which is a uh, mostly South American species. And They've been invading North America, and we have one to show for it in Maine, where of all places, Monhegan. And the bronze <laughs> cowbird uh, is another one of these blackbirds from the West. Um, and this one was found in October in Rockland. And one more blackbird, this was the Brewer's blackbird, which was found uh, on Monhegan in September. Now onto the warblers, just a few one of which is the Swainson's warbler, a bird of thicket, thickets in the southwest, southeastern part of the United States. And one showed up somehow here in Maine um, on, um, in Bar Harbor. And then this is not a very good picture, but this is just an amazing vagrant. It's called a Kirtland's warbler. And the guy who found this um, actually didn't have his camera. He only had a little pocket, well, he had his phone. And what he did was take his binoculars and put his phone up to his binoculars. And so he got a binocular scope view of, of this bird. But Kirtland's warbler is one of the rarest warblers. It is the rarest warbler in North America. Population was down to as few as 400 only 30, 40 years ago. 
and now the population is about about 2,000. They all breed in upper peninsula uh, in the upper part of Lower Peninsula, Michigan. Uh, some in Minnesota and a couple in Ontario, a couple of populations in Ontario. But there are only about 2,000 of these. And what do they do? They migrate from that area down to the Bahamas. Well, the Maine is not on the way from the Bahamas, right? So somehow this bird ended up way, way out of out of uh, wh where it should have been. Perhaps reverse migration or failure to properly navigate. We don't know, but it was certainly a, a, just an amazing record just because of how far it was from its normal range and also because it, they're so darn rare to start with. It's one thing to see a vagrant red-eyed vireo. It's another thing to see a vagrant Hurtman's warbler. It's amazing. And then hermit warblers, a beautiful bird from the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, and we, we've had one showed up on Monhegan and another one's on mainland Maine in Harpswell. Oops. And then tanagers, this is a hepatic tanager, which is found rarely in the desert southwest. And we ended up with one here, which stayed from December of 2023 until the 1st of March in Stockton Springs. Um, so uh, somehow ended up there. And then the, the last one of these in my little uh, view here is the Lazuli bunting, which is a, a, a relative of a cardinal. And it, what it did was to show up uh, on Monhegan Island. So. Um, we're gonna end with Wilson's top 10 list of amazing vagrants. So these are the ones that I find most amazing. And I thought about trying to arrange them in a top 10 order, but I couldn't really do it because they could make arguments e either way. But here's some, some of the ones that are amazing. Uh, the Mexican violet ear, violet ear, look where it lives, down in Southern Mexico. Where was it found? One August, Mount Desert Island, just amazing. It, was, it stayed there for two days and then it vamoosed. Then remember I talked about the rails and how they have short wings. Um, and this is a type of rail called a crake, the corn crake. And the corn crake is uh, shown here. Uh, it was photographed on Monhegan. This is the actual one that was there. And uh, what, what we ended up with is somehow a bird that ended up in on Monhegan Island. The closest population, probably Scotland. Okay, and I'm going to take a very brief break because I have to run to the back. Sorry, at the case, at the risk of TMI, I'm, I'm on a diuretic and it works. So <laughs> every, every now and then I have to have a break. But anyway, we'll continue our, our list here. So we have Surfbird, a beautiful sandpiper found on rocky shores in the Pacific Northwest. And one ended up here in Biddeford, just amazing. So how it got across all that long distance, and it's an absolutely beautiful bird. Then the gray-tailed tattler, Look at where these things are found, not even in Alaska. And someone photographed this one uh, on Matenicus Rock, was sitting out there counting puffins, and this thing flew by. That was the, that was the record. It was a two-second record, but it was a photograph, and so they were able to, to grab it. Western reef heron, closest population, West Africa. But one showed up in Kittery, stayed around for, for a week in August. Great knot, again, sort of like the, the uh, gray-tailed tattler way up there in eastern uh, Asia, but no, not in North America normally. And here's another one that showed up offshore in, in Petit Manan National Wildlife Refuge. Amazing record. And this is one that you may have seen, the great black hawk. It, it first showed up down in the Biddeford area in, in August of 2018, 
And you can see the closest population in New Mexico, um, some, but somehow it ended up in Maine and people saw it for a, a, a little bit and then it disappeared. And then it showed up right in downtown Portland at a park and it stayed there from the 29th of October until the end of January when it died. But it was just an absolutely amazing record. Um, and, and it was the, it's the only North American, North American record. Can you believe that? And where does it show up? In Maine. So fantastic stuff. That's a vagrant for you. Here's another vagrant. This one was a uh, fairly short term, but someone saw this bird out on North Haven. It's called the Western Marsh Harrier. You can see they're found in Eurasia. So that's the source population in Africa as well. That's the source population. And somehow uh, it ended up uh, in down in Thomaston as well as in North Haven. So it stayed around for three days and a lot of people got to see that one. And then this next one won't surprise you. It's the stellar sea eagle, okay? So that's a great vagrant. And even though it has showed up in Maine two different years, showed up first on the 30th of December, 2021, and stayed until the first of March, or the early March in 2022. And then it showed up again the following winter um, on the 4th of February and stayed around for 11 days and then it disappeared. It's still alive and it's still in Newfoundland. But uh, I, I count this as just a single vagrant, even though it came to see us two different years. But uh, again, the, the uh, source population is, uh, your, is, is Asian. Um, and occasionally get, we get a record in, um, in Alaska, but finding one here is crazy. And you know what, you, you remember what the whole story behind this thing was? It was first seen in Texas. And then it showed up in Massachusetts, ended up in New Brunswick, Maine, Nova Scotia, back to back to Massachusetts, then to Newfoundland, and it's just gone all around. It is truly a vagrant. So a lot of its movements have been of its own volition. There's no question about that. But did it get all the way across the country by itself? Well, quite possibly. Did it have some sort of navigational error? Possibly. We just don't know. But I think all of us were just thrilled to, to be able to see this uh, fantastic bird. And then the last one I have is my favorite example. Um, and it's this flycatcher called the variegated flycatcher. And one showed up in Biddeford Pool, at Biddeford, the area around Biddeford Pool, um, on the 5th of November in 1977. That was before we moved to Maine. So, and I, But I remember hearing about that and people were saying, well, there's this sulfur-bellied flycatcher in Maine. And everyone thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So sulfur-bellied flycatchers, now called streaked flycatchers, live in south, southeastern Arizona. So if you want to see a, one of those, you, that's where you go. But then people realized that, that this bird that they saw here in Maine was not, in fact, a sulfur-bellied flycatcher, but, in fact, a variegated flycatcher. Look where they live. They live in South America. And this is one of the few species of, of passerines that's what we call an austral migrant. So they spend their winter in the equatorial regions. That's pretty good. But instead of migrating north to breed, they migrate south. So they migrate to the south. Um, and what we, what we think what was going on here is that this bird was trying to migrate from here to here. And we think it was a reverse migrant. And so if you draw that line, extend that line, guess where you end up? Bitterford, well, at least, at least close by. Uh, you, you end up in the northeastern part of the United States. So the bird stayed around for another five days, and a, a lot of people got to see it, but it was just uh, fantastic. And I think this is one that we can clearly attribute to, to reverse migration. There have since been four or five other records. Let's see, Ontario, Tennessee, Florida, Washington State. But the variegated flycatcher was the first record for North America. And isn't that amazing? An Argentinian bird ending up in, in the state of Maine. So anyway, there was a lot of, a lot of pictures there and I hope that, that you got to think about how the birds got to get, how they got where they did, perhaps how, how they did. Uh, but the, migrant, the vagrants are just absolutely wonderful to see. And then it's also wonderful just to think about how it is they came to be where they are, where they normally wouldn't belong. So anyway, I will stop there and I'd be delighted to take any questions you might have. Penny. 
we, 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 we would so love to know that. And, and I, I think most people would say that the ones that are long distances probably succumb. That, but the, the stellar sea eagle is an example of one that's not, that's not doing that. But uh, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. I wish we knew answer to more of that, answers to more of those sorts of questions. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, the, yeah. So there, there are. It's easier to see birds on islands where there's not as many trees, right? And there, there are places where lots of rare birds have been found. So that means birders go there and they find more rare birds, and that means more birders go there and they find more rare birds. So that there's that effect. It, it actually has a, a name in the birding uh, literature. It's called the Patagonia picnic table effect. <laughs> And the reason we call it is, is Patagonia is a place in Arizona. This Patagonia is a place in Arizona where there's a little picnic table. And someone found a, a, a rare bird there uh, some years ago. I've forgotten which one it was. But anyway, birders started flocking there. Um, and and they, of course, they started finding more rare birds. And so all of a sudden, the Patagonia picnic table was, was just this constant roiling of birders coming in, finding all these rare birds. So there's some of that going on as well. But I think there's also some of the fact that birds are pushed offshore by these winds that they don't expect and that they find these islands as the first first place of refuge. So that's part of it, I think. But uh, yeah, it's a great, great question. Yeah, there, there, could, there could be a whole lot of vagrants up in the middle of Arista County, but no one ever birds there. So who knows for sure, right? Yes, please. It, it could be, yep. That's that's certainly a possibility. Certainly a possibility. Yep. It'd be wonderful to get in the mind of a bird to know to know these sorts of things. But yeah, they could be lost. There, there's there's no question. There, there there's both there's both intentional vagrancy and there's unintentional vagrancy, and uh, and there's probably some mix of, of the two as well. So uh, I got pushed where I didn't want to be. Now what am I going to do? So there, there may be, yeah. You, you just never know. You never know where you, where these birds are going to show up. I mean, it's just amazing. Like, who, who would figure that a, a, a little farm pond up in near Dover Foxcroft is going to be where the first roseate spoonbill in New England was ever found? It's crazy. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, 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 in some ways, the Migratory Bird Protection Act is is misnamed because what it what it really does is to protect any bird that is wild uh, in North America, even if it's not native. So the Migratory Bird Act does does not protect starlings, pigeons, uh, and uh, house sparrows, uh, and it also they're game birds that are not subject to that. They're dependent more on hunting life, hunting hunting laws. But other birds, including vagrants, are absolutely protected. So if someone were to kill stellar sea eagle, they, they would suffer the same, um, uh, crime, be charged with the same crime as if they shot a bald eagle, which is big time stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember there was one, one guy in Washington State when we were living out there was was caught shooting a bald eagle and it, it cost him 10,000 bucks. So. Yes, please. I think it was 2021. I think that was, yeah. I think it was 2021. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's the, the sort of the inference here is that the, they can be pretty long lives. So, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think most people are most wildlife biologists are using more of a hands-off approach because you, you don't really know where that bird was, was ultimately came from and there there could be 
you, I mean, it's just it's admittedly just one bird, but but you still worry about introducing genes to a part of the range where they normally aren't. So I, I think most people say, well, this is amazing, but we're just going to let nature take its course. But I, that's a great question, though. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for uh, putting up with uh, picture after picture after picture. But uh, there's some pretty remarkable birds. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Zoom people. Do I need to stop it? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm on the camera up there. Yes. Yeah. Shooting you the whole time. I used to go back and forth, but uh, we think that if we can do it. Uh, I, I, know I, I know I did start it, but I don't know if I. I think Nick was recording it too. Okay. Oh, Paul, stop recording. Why don't... I'll, I'll do stop recording. Okay. Let's see what next. I'll take your uh, link there. Okay. Will we learn how to do this better yeah. next time or not? Yeah, exactly. So, are are we okay with saving? Uh, are, are we okay with saving it? I I have. It has been saved already. No. Okay. So I I have it says stop stop cloud recording. I. Uh, 